Okay, welcome back. And so today we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, let's uh, take a look at how we're going to do one of these um, print statements with using f strings. So let's open up a um, let's grab our let's grab our textbook here and we can drag it over so that we can have it on the side. Whoa, that's a little bit too small. I think we're going to have to zoom in on that. You can do control zoom. Yeah, let's uh, Okay, so that's not too bad. Uh, all right. Um so actually let's take that up one more. There, that's that's good. So here, we're going to go into Python, and I'd like you to follow along with me. We're going to go into Python 3, and um, I'd like you to practice this with me. So we're going to go print using an f string, and, and bef before we do the f string, let's make a variable. Let's say, uh, let's say something like um, dog equals um, how about we go or that's what what's a good kind of a dog a shepherd and um, let's go name equals uh, Fido and so now we could do something like this. We could say print f, and I can say my dogs, and now I go, because now I'm going to use a variable, okay? Name is. My dog Fido is a. Well, I, maybe I should have used a different thing there, but if I go dog here, that doesn't make total sense. My dog's name is a dog. What's that going to print? Is that going to work? What's it going to replace for name? My dog's Fido is a shepherd. Does that work? My dog's Fido is a shepherd. Um, get rid of the S on dog. Yeah. So let's delete that. And now it says, my dog Fido is a shepherd. That's better, right? Better English. So do you guys understand now how to use F, uh, F strings with print? You basically encapsulate the variable in curly braces. Okay. Um, another way that you can use it is if you want to um, format some like a a decimal. For example, if I went um, print f, and then I went, uh, let's say I did. So you can actually do uh, something like this. Ready? 2 divided by 3 is equal to. Now I can evaluate that. So you can actually also evaluate things inside here. And I can go 2 divided by 3. And now I'll close the quotes. I'll close the, the print statement. And now it says 2 divided by 3 equals 0.666 repeating. So notice that the, what's in the curly braces here is not a variable. Rather, it's an expression. It's a mathematical expression. And it's being evaluated. Okay, I could have done this differently. I could have said something like x equals 
2 divided by 3. Okay, and now x would be that. And then I could do this, and now I could just replace 2 divided by 3 here with an x, and it would be the exact same thing. Try it. So, um, it's really up to you how you do it. It depends on your purpose, on what you're trying to achieve. But, I will say this. It looks kind of ugly with all those sixes. It would be nice if we could make it less than that. And so the way to do that is you put a full colon there, and now you use like a, a formatting uh, representation to say, I just want to have four uh, places, four decimal, four digits after the decimal in my floating point number, and, and that's what it would do in that case. Okay, and that's in the book right here. They just they just use it. They use dot format instead of the f string, but I prefer the f string. Does that make sense? What's happening here? Remember, everything inside the curly braces is being evaluated, so it's not actually. So you evaluate what's in there, and then you print the value of it. Okay. Um, Yeah. So let's scroll down in the book. And OK. So at this point, to show you this one, we're going to have to actually use Genie to show you the end part. OK? Because I can't show it to you here. So yeah, yeah, here it comes. We're moving up. Let's start up Genie. And I'd like you to do that too. So you just come over here. And you can go over to development and click on Genie, and it, you should start something that looks like that. Now, the first things first, before we continue with using Genie, let's set it up so that it's uh, proper. So let's go to edit preferences on Genie. I'd like you guys to follow um, me in this with, with your own software, and do it at home as well, obviously. Uh, this stuff we can leave and one thing I'd like you to make sure is that your editor font is a monospace font okay now maybe I might make my font a little bit bigger just so that it's easy to see but I want you to make sure that it's monospaced because when we do programming, it's important that we don't use proportional. Sp uh, it's that's horrible. Okay, for programming, you have to use monospace. It'll become evident later why that's a good idea. But um, indentation is that. So go down to editor and then go down to indentation, and I want you to make sure the width is set at four. But I want you now to change the type. To spaces. Okay, so make sure you click spaces for type and leave the width at four. Okay, uh, this is not important right now, and neither is this right now. Okay, you want me to go back? Four and spaces. Okay. And then display. Oh, make sure that show line numbers is uh, click checked as well. That's good to have. Okay. And I think that's about it. Okay. So let's just go apply and okay. And so now we can. Uh, start typing. So let's, uh, let's, first of all, let's just do a regular print hello world. Okay. And now I'm curious to, to know if Genie is set up for Python 3. We're going to find out right now. We're going to have to save this file. Okay. Let's go save. 
Now it's going to ask us where we want to save it. And um, you can basically put it in your home directory. I'm going to make a new directory here. Or, uh, and I'm just going to call it, you know, um, let's call it, I'm going to call it lesson two. Uh, you don't have to put it in lesson two. You can just put it in your home directory. And I'm going to call this, uh, oops, what did I just do here? Uh, okay. I'm going to call it uh, hello. Now, I, this is really important. This part I want you to memorize. All Python programs have to end in .py. OK? Personally, I'm on, I'm, well, we're using Linux here, so I'm, I don't, I would prefer not to have uh, spaces in my file name. So I'm just going to call it hello.py and then I'm going to hit save. Oh wait, I got to go into lesson two. There. Okay. Notice that once it's saved, I end up having color highlighting. So, Py so Genie recognizes that this is a Python file and it has colored it appropriately. Now I'm going to run this program. And so the way to run it, it's super easy, but let's see if it works. Hit F5 on your, yay, it worked. So if you hit F5, it should just bring up another window with the program executed. And it shows you the output of it. Okay. The reason why I was suspecting it might not work is I wasn't sure if Genie was set up for Python 3, but it is. OK? So it, notice it says now just hit return to continue. So if I just hit enter now, it, it goes away. So I can continue to do this. I can watch this. I can hit F5. Boom, it runs. Yay! Hit enter. F5, enter. F5, enter. I'd like you to try that, get used to hitting F5 and then enter to make it go away. So that's the F5, when I say F5, I'm talking about the function keys at the top of your keyboard, right? So that's how you run a program. That's how easy it is to use Genie. Now, let's go back to the textbook. Okay, so let's. Which side was my textbook on? Uh, my textbook was on the right side. OK, so notice here's my textbook. So what is this end thing here? OK, so watch. I'm going to write, I'm going to put another print statement here. Let's go print, uh, this is cool. I want you guys to try that as well. And now, um, I wonder if hitting F5 will automatically save it for me. It does. Yes, for the win. All right, I don't even have to save it. Basically, F5 saves it and runs it all together. How wonderful. Awesome for lazy people like us. OK, so uh, notice, though, that this is cool is on the second line. So what if you said, ah, but Mr. Ark, I, uh, I don't want this is cool to appear on the next line. I want it to appear on the line before. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, geez, you could have just put it right there, right? You could have just typed this is cool right there. Well, there is another way, and this is actually more useful than you might suspect. But what you do is let's just copy this code right here, and let's put in a comma, and we'll go end. And we'll say equals, quote, quote. Hmm. Not sure why that's not working. It should work. Let's try running this from the terminal. So if I go lesson two and I go Python three, uh, it works here. Aha! 
That means my suspicion was correct. It's not using Python 3. So we got to go back into here. Because, because I put brackets, I assumed it was, but it's not. So I've got to go into set build commands here. Go to build in Genie and go set build commands. Aha! There's the problem. All right. So notice here, it just says Python and not Python 3 under execute. See that? So I'd like you to type in a 3 right there. Okay? And then go OK. So you're going to have to, to do this at obviously on your own computer as well because I suspected that Genie was set up for Python 2. But as long as you just go into, okay, so I'm going to go OK. Just once again to show you where that was up to build, up to set, down to set build commands, and then go down here to execute, click in this window, and make sure you put a three, no space, after Python, and then click OK. Now, if I hit F5, it works. No error anymore. So that is the uh, method for preventing a new line with a print. Because by default, print will put a new line character at the end. OK? Yeah, question. OK, I'll do it again. I'll show you one more time. So go to build, go to set build commands, come down here to the box after execute click in here it was like this I simply put a 3 after the word without a space and then I clicked OK that's it alright so now what we're gonna do is um, let's move down okay uh, Listen, sometimes you want the opposite of this. So you might want extra. You might want an extra space. So you actually can, can put the extra space inside of it. So you can get rid of this. And you could go backslash n. Now what happens is the print ha will put a new line character by default. But we're putting an extra one in. Remember, backslash n is new line. So if I hit F5 on that, now there's an extra blank space after hello world. And that's the, blank, that's the backslash n. OK? So um, that's all that, that, that's required to learn there. But I have to say, please. This, this and equals uh, just an empty string is sometimes can be really useful. So then we're talking about escape sequences here. And um, the two escape sequences really that I want you to uh, recognize are backslash n. And the other one, which I think is kind of cool, is backslash t, which is a tab. right? So if I did backslash t here. And then I did F5. Notice that there's a tab after hello. I actually don't use backslash T that much. Maybe when I'm trying to format things for columns, I might try and use it. OK? Um, now. You can use raw strings as well by putting an R in front of the string. I, I don't actually use that very much. Um, let's see, what do they say here about raw strings? If you need to specify some strings where no special processing such as escape sequences are handled, then what you need to do is specify a raw string. So in that case, um, the backslash N is not going to be processed as a new line. OK? 
Okay. I, I don't tend to use that often. So now we're into variables and um, identifier naming. So what are some valid, so what are some, um, what are the rules for making up a variable? So a variable is something where you have x equals. So for example, if I had the line, it doesn't have to be x. It could be anything you want. So it could, I can have x equals 1. I could have um, bb equals 3.3. .3. I can have um, jj equals, or it doesn't have to be double letters. It could be anything. But what they're trying to express here is that please use something that is descriptive. In other words, x and bb, well, bb could be descriptive. x isn't super descriptive. Uh, in fact, it's very generic. But for example, if I wanted to type in a person's name, then I could say name equals Henry. All right? So Henry is a name. So therefore, when I choose a variable to store that information, I'm going to pick a variable name that is descriptive, excuse the pun, because I used the, the variable name. Um, how about this? How about I could use something like um, length equals uh, something like you know 10. Now you know that, that OK, what is that 10 represent? Oh, it must be the length of something, because he used the word length. All of the words on the left are things that I make up. They're not special in Python. Okay, They're called variables. You, as the programmer, choose what you want the variables to be called. I don't want you to write programs that basically do this. Go x equals you know, something, and then y, or y equals something, or z equals something. This is that they don't x y z or a b c they don't really represent much you can get away with it now and then for things let's say for an index or something which i'll explain what that is later with like an x or something but oftentimes i would prefer to you use something that describes what's being stored okay what are the rules for it first off let's let's read through them okay it says the first character must be a letter Okay, or an underscore, but I would actually discourage you from using an underscore because in Python that can have special meaning. The rest of the the rest of the identifier consists of letters, or underscores, or digits. Identifier names are case sensitive. Okay, so uppercase A is not the same as lowercase A. And uh, here are some examples of valid uh, ones. So notice that it says the first one must start with a letter. In other words, if I did, if I said something like this, you can't say 3x equals hello. That's not going to work. That's invalid. If I try running this, watch what happens. It says, whoa, what, what do you mean there? It says syntax error. Syntax error means that there's something wrong with your code. Python can't understand it. Does that make sense? I want you to remember that syntax error. It's like it's like in English, it's like saying like a gram it's like a grammatical error or like a spelling error, that type of thing. Um, however, look, I can say x3 equals hello and hit F5 on that, and it works doesn't complain on that. What, what's the difference? Well, it has to start with a letter. Okay, So that's actually a pretty good test question to ask. Is, you know, uh, what, do vari what must variables begin with? Can they contain numbers? Sure, but as long as it's not the first thing. Another thing which I don't want you to do is please don't put spaces in a variable that doesn't work. Okay, so let's say for example if you said big apple 
equals New York. That's not going to work. Watch. Okay. Why is that? Because sp the space is a delimiter and Python can't understand that you want your variable to have a space in it. That's not going to work for you. Now, how would you do this? Th how would you basically achieve this without having the space? And here's the answer. Ready? Look. You just go underscore. Okay? So when you do underscore, and now if I hit F5, now no problem. There's no error. Okay? So computer programmers use underscore instead of spaces. By the way, I like to do that also with my file names. So when I save a file name, I'm not going to want to tend to put a space in my file name. I'll use underscores instead. OK? Any questions so far? Great. OK, so um, let's move on here. Let me slide this over a little bit and now we've got data types I think we went over that last time right so in this case X is an integer I want you to recognize that watch now I'm gonna do I'm gonna take this opportunity to use a comment this is an integer this is a float this is a string. Okay, those are the three variable types that I want you to recognize right now. There's there's another one which I could. Um, why not? Let's do it now. There's one more actually that I'd like to introduce to you right now, and that's called a boolean data type. And so that one is um, like this. And that would be a Boolean. So that's a comment. Remember, the comments don't get executed. So if I, if I run this, uh-oh. Oh, wait, my bad. Um, this isn't C++ or C. I have to use a capital T. So notice when I use a capital T, I should have recognized it because it, it didn't actually change it, the color of it. Um, it now recognizes it. So if I hit F5 now, there's no error. It's good that we did that. By the way, a Boolean variable can only have two values. It can either be true or it can be false. And you guessed it, false also has to start with a capital F. OK, so those are the, those are the main types of uh, data that I'd like you to recognize or be aware of at this point. By the way, once again, alive is just a variable name. I could have called it anything. But the true and the false cannot be anything. They're very specific. You have to type them exactly. OK? So what would you use this for? Well, if you look at my example for Alive, what if you were making a video game and you had some type of uh, a character in your video game? And in order to determine if the character is alive, you could have a Boolean variable where it says alive while alive, you know, is if if the alive variable is true, then you can do something with the guy because he's still alive. But if it's not true, then then you would set it to false when the character died, for example. Okay. So let's move on. Um, Python refers to anything used in a program as an object. 
So this is the really nice thing. Python is strongly object oriented, but it is dynamically typed. Now, what does dynamically typed mean? It means that, number one, we don't declare variables. I know what you're thinking. You've never done programming before. What's declaring? Well, you don't know what you don't know. But here, I have that's called assigning. I'm assigning the value 1, or the object. Actually, in this case, because Python's object-oriented for everything, I would say the object 1, but it's weird to say that. I'd probably say the integer 1, even though the integer is an object. The integer 1 is being assigned to x. You know what I've even seen students do? Now, don't do this. Oops. Uh, don't do this, but... Um, I've seen students do this. That's, that's like reading backwards. H how do you read a book in English from left to right? That's not correct. Okay. So if I tried running this, look what happens. Syntax error. Can't assign to literal. Yeah, that, that's just wrong. So it, you have to put the variable first and then the value after the equal sign. OK? Um, let's move on. Oh, I was going to mention something about dynamically typed. Yes, it's strongly object oriented, but what does it mean to be dynamically typed? Well, here's what it means to be dynamically typed. Ready? There. So let's just take a look at this and let's print x right there just to see what the value of x is. Question, what do you think is going to print out? A 1 or a 3.3? Take a guess. 3.3. Let's find out. Ready? F5. Haha. -ha. So it is the last thing that you assign to it. Now, what this is an example of here, you can't do this in languages that are statically typed. Why? I'll tell you why. It's because we changed the type of information x is storing. On line 5, it's storing an integer. But on line 6, it's storing a float. That's how the dyna dynamic means changing okay and we were able to change the type of the variable x in that example um yeah we're not going to use pycharm so we can skip over this um okay so we can use math too so for example, in our in our example here, we could do something like um, how about we do something like um, y equals four, and then I could say print x plus y, and now when I hit F five. I'm going to get 7.3. Notice it's not a 5, right? Because this guy gets overwritten with line 6. So we could basically just get rid of this line. That would be confusing. And that's the... So 3.3 plus 4 is 7.3. OK. You can do this a different way, too. Um, you could go something like this. You could say total equals x plus y. And then here you would just print total. Notice I'm using now a variable that is meaningful, the word total. And so when I hit F5, notice it does the same thing. But in this case, I've stored the result. Previously, I did not store the result anywhere. It just got printed. 
Okay, that's the difference. Here, the result is being stored in a variable called total. Before, it was not. Okay, I'm forgetting to close all these windows. Um, the other thing which I want to show you, and this is they're actually using an example here of incrementing. So when we, when we increment, um, it means we're going to add something to an existing variable. So let's kind of uh, clean up our code here a little bit and let's let's actually get rid of everything here. Control A, <coughs> delete. And if I said something like x equals 1. And then I said, now watch this. I can actually write, this is a mathematical expression. If I say x equals x plus 1. Let's make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. I should have done that earlier. Um, and so now, if I print x, what do you think the value of x will be? Do you think it's going to be a 1 or something else? I want you to make a prediction. You don't have to say it out loud, but just think about what, the, what you think the answer will be. And then let's run it. Here we go. And notice the answer is a 2. So let's think about how this works. And the way I want you to recognize this is the right hand side, this, gets evaluated first. And then it gets assigned to whatever's on the left. So first what happens is, is that we say, OK, what's the value of x? Well, we have to go to the line above and see, aha, the value of x is a 1. So we'll replace this x here with a 1. And then we'll add 1 plus 1. And now the new value of x, so this x, becomes a 2. And then we print it out. Does that seem logical to you? OK. So here's my next question to you. Is um, what if I did this? What if I said, let's say x equals 3, and then I said x equals x times 2. Can you figure out what the answer is in that situation? Let's try it out. Make an, don't, don't like watch, wait for me to hit it. Um, you guys, by, should we, by the way, should be typing all this as well, so not passively watching, but actively typing. That's how you'll learn. So let's hit F5, and the answer is 6. How many people got it right? Good. Excellent. So 3 times 2, the old value was a 3 here, and then it gets um, multiplied by 2, and now it gets assigned to the new value of x. OK. So you can, you can use that same concept with addition, subtraction, division, whatever you want. OK. Um, they do a little bit of multi-line variable here. So we can try that as well. Let's try that. For example, we could say um, it doesn't have to be s. It could be anything. Um, I'll call it sentence equals 1, 2, 3. This is a multi-line string 1, 2, 3. OK, and then I'll go print 
send. Now if I hit F5, boom. Notice it says it 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 prints it exactly the way I typed it out because and you can only do that with triple single quotes. Quote quote quote. Okay? So if I use like if I use just a double quote or a, a single single quote, that's not gonna work. Okay. Logical and physical lines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even want to show you this. It's just so ugly. N I, I'll just say this right now. Never do this. I don't know why they put it in the book because I, I wish they wouldn't even show you this. I don't want you to see this. Uh, but you can actually put semicolons at the end of a line and then put another line after it. Don't do it. I'm not even going to type it out. So don't do that. It's just ugly, unnecessary, and... Is it like not very efficient? No, it's got nothing to do with efficiency. Um, it's got to do with readability and um, elegance. You want to have... You don't want to use a semicolon in that way. What they're trying to say there is that you, you could do two things on one line by using a semicolon, but I'm going to say don't do it. It's much, your program's much easier to read and under, understand if you make one uh, line per command. Okay? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually kind of cool. Because th this you should see. So um, this is when you want to program something, but you just don't have enough space in your editor. So for example, if I wanted to print something like, um, or, or uh, it doesn't even have to be a print. It could be like a, a, a variable. Like they're using s. I'll, I'll use s too. So notice I'm not going to do a triple quote here. This is a single quote. This is a super long line, and it is going to run off the end of my screen. All right, done. Now, let's say you're editing this code, and you look at it, and you're like, Oh, I can't see it. What, what comes? What is? Uh, oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me scroll. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. So in order to fix that, you can just simply do this. Boom. And then you could just go. You could have another one here. It doesn't, they don't have to line up, but it looks nice if they do. And so now, if I go print S, F5, notice that it doesn't actually treat it like this one. This is different. This actually goes on multiple lines. This one all appears on the same line. Um, but when I'm reading the code, I want to be able to see it all without having to scroll sideways. That's what those backslashes are for. Okay? So it's referred to as explicit line joining. But don't do it for something like this. That's ridiculous. Okay, you only do it for in situations where your line is so long that e you'd have to scroll sideways to see it. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, one of the um, one of the rules for how long a line can be, I think, is 80 characters. Um, so there's actually a line here in Genie. If you if you see it. It's right there. See that? I don't know if you can see it. It's quite faint, but there's a vertical line right there. 
and I think that represents 80 characters. Okay. Um, now, indentation matters on the left. Okay? So if we were to do something like this, if we were to hit the tab here and get, oh, wait. That's not good. That's a tab. Wait, did I fix that? Edit preferences. Uh, editor indentation. Oh, I think I when I started this file, it wasn't on that. So I think I have to um, here. Let's let's save this. Um, let's just go file save, and let's. I think I can actually do it here, but um, I can click here. It'll it'll say replace tabs with spaces, but I'm wondering why it's doing this now. Let me try closing this and starting it up again. And. Now let me try and hit space. No, it's still putting in a tab. Um, oh, maybe it is spaces. That's weird. I, I think it's, oh, right, right, right. It's trying to help me by making me skip through those spaces quickly. Um, so let me, okay, let's get back to what I was trying to teach earlier, and that is that you can't put even, even one space, even if you go one space, this is still an error. So if I, if I F5 this, it's not going to run because it says indentation error. It's, that's, so that's one of the interesting things about Python is that it will, use indentation to uh, define blocks of code. And we don't have a, we, we don't have, we, well, I haven't taught you if statements or for loops yet, but at this point, an indenting the line in the beginning is a mistake. Okay? So don't do it yet. We'll learn when that's appropriate soon. OK, so we're done this, uh, this chapter here. Um, so let's scroll down. And let's go to operators and expressions. Um, before we do that, I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to. Um, ask you guys to write a little program that uh, prints out the uh, prints out the picture of a little home okay so an ASCII style home so if I show you what that means if I go to Google I'll go ASCII uh, house picture something simple simple though okay so it doesn't have to be this complicated basically I just wanted to print out uh, something like a roof and the walls and that's about it doesn't have to doesn't have to be complicated these are these are really um, good ones, right? That, that That's a cute one. It's a haunted house one, right? But at this point, you have the ability to create something like this just with using the print statement, OK? So I'll give you a few minutes to try that. Go ahead and do that. OK. So what I'd like you to do now that you've kind of had a look at that, I'll show you an example of um, some of the ones on the internet. Like that's a pretty nice looking one. I 
would be surprised if anybody did something that elaborate, but it doesn't have to be that that much work. Um, like a third of that would be enough. But in any case, I hope you were successful making a little uh, house using the print statement and special characters. And some of you may have noticed that if you wanted to print a um, backslash, you actually have to print two of them. So you have to escape the backslash. So use, doing that will actually print just one. Notice we're only printing one of them, not two. It's because if you just print one of them, then it's like you're escaping this character. Okay. So since the backslash is used and is to start an escape sequence, you have to use another one to say, no, I'm actually escaping the escape sequence. I want it to be treated normally. Okay. Uh, in any case, let's go now to the next chapter in the book. And um, in that one, it's called uh, Operators and Expressions. And so I'd like you to kind of go over this on your own, but I will tell you what we're going to cover right now. We're going to cover, obviously, plus, minus, multiply. Power, that's important. That's star, star. So I'd like you to not just look at these, but actually try them at home. There's divide. And then there's floor division. This is important, and I want you to take a look at these. We'll go over these again next time, but I, I want you to just try them out at home first. Now this one, we're going to spend some more time on next period. But that one's called medulo. This one's important. Okay. Um, w now we're gonna uh, skip these guys. So we're gonna skip this left shift, right shift, bitwise operators. We're gonna skip all this until we get to the less than. Okay. So we are gonna learn less than. We're gonna learn greater than less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, and these are all relational operators, okay? And not equal to, and then finally not, which is a Boolean operator, okay? And then we have and and or as well. And then we're going to learn a little bit about uh, shortcut math operations. We'll do those next period as well. Right now I'm just telling you what we're going to cover. Um, so I'd like you to kind of pre-read it and that way we can go more quickly next time. Okay? And order evaluation. I'm sure you've all heard of bed mass before. And so um, that's, the, uh, that's the end of this lesson. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we'll see you next time.